But what is the difference? So laws of war can follow, as I said, into two categories, jus ad bellum and jus in bello. Jus ad bellum suggests or, or directly tan translate is in, in, into the right of war, the actual right to be able to go to war. Interestingly enough, in international law, there is one time in which a state is justified in being able to go to war. And laws governing whether states may resort to war really fall down to this one condition. I think of it in terms of a, a state is deciding whether to mobilize their troops, almost as it's deciding whether to flip a switch into war, to turn on war. And it must decide if it's meeting this one condition, which we'll discuss in the next slide. The next body of law, um, laws of war discusses juice and bellow. Once the, flip, uh, the switch has been flipped, how is a war fought? Is it fought fairly? I know that seems strange, but even in a boxing ring, there are rules of how you must box fairly and, and rules to how you can cheat. There are even laws, there are even rules of how to fight war well that states have agreed to. And the juice and bellow area of, of law looks at the rules of, uh, of war and how war is fought fairly or not fairly or unfairly. Juice ad bellum. Let's start with the question of when it is okay to go to war. The simple answer is, if you are going to war for self-defense, then you are justified. Self-defense, if attacked, the UN Charter is the most narrow interpretation of when it's okay to go to war. It's in, embodied in the UN Charter. It says in Article 51, nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurred. Now this is important because the UN's whole purpose is peace. And so most of the charter talks about how states should not go to war for any reason. But then kind of deep down, set deep down in the charter, in Article 51, it says, but nothing we have said previously will in any way impair the right of a state to be able to defend itself if it's attacked. The last part of it says, until the UN Security Council can decide how they're going to end the situation, and then they'll step in and referee. Interestingly enough, Jus ad Bellum really has that narrow de definition of the UN Charter of self-defense, but in practice, there's a more broad use. In what's called customary law, so not written down as in the UN Charter, but generally practiced, there's this belief of preemptive attack. I think about the details of if you have actually been, if you're sitting at a bar or in a restaurant and you're minding your own business and somebody comes and punches you in the face, you have total right under the UN Charter to be able to punch them back. In customary law, it's understood that you actually don't have to wait until you've been directly punched in the face. You don't have to have a black eye in order to punch back. Instead, this preemptive attack suggests that if you believe and can prove that an attack is imminent, the example being somebody has walked over to you and they have their fist pulled back and are just about to punch you in the face, then you do not have to wait in customary law um, for a punch to occur before you can punch them back. This has happened for centuries where you see battleships uh, off of your coast or troops mobilizing on your border. Customary law says you don't actually have to wait until they kill some of your troops or, or invade some of your territory before you can strike them back, but instead you can strike them preemptively. Interestingly, interestingly, in 2001, after the September 11th attacks, the, the Bush administration expanded this even farther and said, current attacks on the United States are not done via battleship or even done with troops on the borders, but instead terrorist non-state actors in stealthy ways may launch secret attacks as they did during September 11th. As a result, the Bush administration published in a 2002 military strategy, grand strategy, saying that we were not going to wait until we actually see somebody with their um, fist drawn back um, ready to punch us, but instead we may see somebody just looking at us funny over in the corner of a bar or even outside the bar that could potentially come in and hurt us. We might need to attack them then before they get strong enough to actually launch an attack. International law critics have uh, responded by saying that this is not justified in international law. So the bright green center is the clearest distinction of when it's okay to go to war. You can always go to war in international law if you have been directly attacked. Customary law then supports kind of a gray area that says if you can prove that an imminent attack is on the horizon and you can visibly see that there is going to be attack occurring, 
You don't have to actually wait until you're attacked before you can attack back. And then the international, and then the United States posits a broader view that says you might not always see an attack coming. So in, in some certain cases, you may need to attack before they're actually strong enough to be able to attack you. The Libra Code. This was the predecessor to Juice in Bello. This is the code that was actually used that created the first written version of the laws of war. Interestingly enough, it was, it was written down during our Civil War. President Lincoln asked a New York, uh, an NYU uh, scholar, Lieber, to write down a manual for the code of war. The reason for this is that he was finding that he wanted a standard operating procedure for all, UN, uh, all Union soldiers to, to follow the rules of war during the Civil War. He also wanted to then be able to hold soldiers accountable under military tribunals if they broke any of these rules of war. And interestingly enough, Lincoln never determined that the Confederates were a different state. And therefore, his logic was, if he can hold the Union soldiers accountable for war because they're U.S. citizens, he can also hold the Confederate uh, soldiers accountable for war under the same rules if he were to win, which he did. In the late 1800s, this Libra Code began expanding around the world. People found that it would, um, other states found that it would take too much energy to adopt a whole new set of um, laws of war. So instead, they just found that the Libra Code, uh, they cut and paste a great bit of the Libra Code into their own standard operating procedures. As a result, laws of war began to spread um, around the world. In 1868, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia decided that he wanted to outlaw certain technological advancements in war that he couldn't com that were that he didn't have, um, and other states were developing. And so he had an interesting idea. He invited states to get together and to create an international laws of war. So granted, before different people might have been using the same laws of war, but they were using these domestically. He wanted to start creating treaties that had the laws of war codified in treaties that states signed and ratified. Well, what was interesting is that originally, because he was in Russia, he invited people to St. Petersburg in the winter, and everybody said, no thanks, I don't think I want to come. So instead he said, well, I actually have a cousin that lives in the Netherlands in a small town called The Hague. Why don't we meet there in 1899 and we can discuss these laws of war? Well, everybody was interested in going to this beautiful place called The Hague. It's, on the, it's, um, it, it's a beach town. It's on the coast. Um, beautiful weather, beautiful flowers, um, uh, canals, channels, really gorgeous. And so sure enough, everybody was free to meet at The Hague in 1899. Thus, The Hague became the center of international law. Tsar Nicholas II of Russia called for an international conference um, in order to outlaw, outlaw certain types of warfare um, and certain types of weapons, and in 1907 all of this was agreed upon as the Hague Laws. After World War II, states realized that they had focused on how, what weapons should be outlawed, but not actually how states and soldiers specifically in war should conduct themselves. Specifically, after World War II, people realized that civilians had been attacked, threatened, uh, raped, um, tortured during World War II, and they needed to come up with a set of laws that actually protected the people in war. I describe it as a difference between the fighters and the bakers. The fighters are the ones that pick up their weapons in war. The bakers are the ones that might be in the midst of war, but they're just trying to live their lives. In um, 1948, the Geneva Conventions were, were a set of treaties, a set of conventions, um, that were codified that had the laws of war and how we treat individual civilians within war. The first one was called the wounded and sick in the field. The first convention focuses on a fighter who picked up a weapon but then got injured or got sick and can no longer fight. And the, this particular convention protects that fighter, puts that, that person now in a new classification. They're no longer an, a, a capable fighter but instead should be protected. It was in this convention that it was um, decided that the Red Cross would be a symbol that if that injured person had on their person or a, there was a tent, a hospital tent or a hospital transport truck of any kind that had the Red Cross, that this was off limits, that nobody could attack this. Otherwise, they would be in breach of the laws of war. The second convention just takes the same logic of the first and applies it to, to sea warfare. 
instead of a, a transport vehicle, um, or sorry, a, tra a, a hospital tent, it would be a hospital boat. Instead of a, um, a van, it would be a, um, a boat with a Red Cross transporting the sick and wounded. Other than that, the logic remains. The next two conventions handle different types of, uh, of bakers, we'll call them non-fighters. The, first, uh, the, the third convention, uh, Geneva Convention, deals with the prisoners of war, or POWs. Now these are fighters that, didn't, that um, did not get sick on the battlefield necessarily, but instead were captured from the, by the enemy. And this convention lays out all of the rules in which prisoners of war must be protected. It includes that you cannot torture prisoners of war, that you must give them adequate food and housing, and that after the war is over, you must um, rapidly return them to their homeland. The fourth convention of um, Geneva Convention uh, discusses the bakers, the civilians in war, though who, those who never picked up um, a weapon to begin with, and how they will be protected. Generally, this convention says that they must be um, given adequate rights. If you happen to occupy a territory, for example, Nazi Germany moved into Poland or moved in, um, uh, west into France and occupied these two territories, the Geneva Conventions is meant to protect the civilians that are being occupied within these territories. Um, in addition to the four conventions, there has been subsequent protocols and common articles. Without going to, uh, into detail about these, generally these, these um, suggest that all of these rights that are given to state actors, state officials like army, those who are part of the army or navy, should also be applied to non-state actors like um, uh, insurgency groups. The U.S. has not signed any of these because we really believe that there's a difference between state officials being protected and those non-state actors, um, such as arguably terrorist or insurgency groups, and um, how we should protect